so I'm going to try to wrap up the session quickly so we can all get to lunch. Um, but Lori and Pete both did a great job of explaining bioelectrochemical systems and their uh, especially the relevance to astrobiology. And I'll talk about uh, one of our systems. So first I'd like to acknowledge my lab group. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Naval Research Lab. Uh, Sarah Glavin is my PI. Um, Brian Eddy and Anthony Malinowski help with bioinformatics. And Matt Yates and Lenny Tender are electrochemists. And so there's a lot of us that have come together uh, to characterize uh, the system I'll talk to you about today. And so, um, again, we heard from both uh, Lori and Pete about bioelectrochemical systems, and I really like what Pete had to say, that all life is sort of a bioelectrochemical system in the environment. Um, but again, we're looking at bioelectrochemical systems basically as a way to culture uh, organisms or communities, and we can look directly at electron transfer and see what energy is required and what energy is moving through the system. And so um, here I have a benthic microbial fuel cell, which is benthic is at the bottom of the ocean um, or a river. And typically we have one electrode that's in the sediment, and at this electrode microorganis microorganisms are capable of oxidizing organics, and those electrons are moved, um, pushed onto that electrode. Uh, the electrons can move through the system to uh, another electrode in the overlying seawater, and here, other uh, microorganisms are capable of use, utilizing those uh, electrons for reduction reactions. And so uh, there's uh, generally two types of BES um, where uh, you keep either an electrode at an anodic potential and you have electricity production, or you keep the electrode at um, a cathodic potential and you use uh, the microorganisms use that, uh, those electrons for uh, reduction reactions. And so again, um, as Pete and Lori showed us, there's many applications of BES uh, with relevance to astrobiology, specifically if we want to look at how electron transfer is working um, in unique communities. And so uh, Lori showed uh, some hydrothermal vents. Um, there's also some um, applications of microbial fuel cells to life detection. Um, in this case, current production would be uh, correlated with uh, photo or chemolithoautotrophic uh, microorganisms. BES in general have a lot of use in wastewater treatment, uh, nutrient recycling, and so they're also looked at as potential life support systems for um, both the ISS and for long-term space travel. And so uh, the system I'm going to talk to you about today um, is a unique system where we were trying to make a rechargeable battery. So many uh, my, uh, microbial electrochemical systems can be thought of as batteries, as Lori Barge mentioned. Um, but what we wanted to do here, instead of having a set anode and a set cathode um, in the uh, ocean sediment and in the overlying seawater, um, and having power production from oxidation of organics at the anode, we wanted to see if we could uh, basically switch this anode to a cathode and push power into the system. We wanted to be able to push power um, into the sediment, have organisms utilize those electrons and store that charge at, in charge carrying molecules in the sediment. We'd be able to use this later um, for uh, it, um, fueling uh, instruments at the bottom of the ocean or submersibles, for example. Um, and so uh, what we did is we took an initial inoculum from a river sediment and we uh, put it, we brought it into a lab scale environment and we used a typical H cell bioelectrochemical reactor. And so here we don't have a sediment electrode, but we have a counter electrode and a working electrode. The working electrode is the one that we're going to switch the potential back and forth to see if we can um, both produce power and consume power depending on our needs. And so our inoculum was a river sediment. We used anaerobic artificial seawater as a culture medium. And the working electrode was a piece of carbon cloth. Um, and basically, we alternated the, the potential of this working electrode from operating at a cathode, where electrons are available to the microorganisms, to operating as an anode, where the electrode operates as an electron acceptor. 
We did, oopsie, we used um, a 20 minute charge discharge cycle. And so every 10 minutes, the um, electrode potential would switch on the working electrode. We also covered um, the reactors so that we could uh, harvest or enrich for non-photosynthetic organisms. And so on this graph on the right, it's uh, current density over time. And basically, at both, when the electrode is operating at either potential, um, a current is generated. And as you can see, around 10 days, we start to see this symmetric increase and decrease in current. And each data point is representative of one 10-minute cycle. And so every 10 minutes, again, this cycle is switching between anodic current and cathodic current. And so this symmetric increase um, in both currents suggests that the same pathway or biochemical reaction is occurring to allow this reversibility of the system. Um, so what we wanted to figure out who's there and what are they doing. Uh, we initially um, inoculated from a river sediment, and so it's just a bacterial community that's been enriched for this reversibility. So we did uh, first a metagenomics analysis. We retrieved um, initially 135 bins, which could be potentially 135 uh, different organisms. Only 58 of those bins have at least 80% completeness. There's at least 16 bins that are, make up at least 1% relative abundance in the community, um, and 10 of these bins are at least 92% complete. Five bins have at least relative, have a relative abundance of at least 6%, and of these five, two bins uh, are delta proteobacteria. And so for a BES, uh, this indicates relatively high diversity and the presence of sulfate-reducing bacteria. Um, and so uh, in our metagenomics analysis, uh, we were also able to assign a taxonomy. Um, these are our uh, what we're confident in assigning, um, but you'll see that our um, average abundant, our most abundant organisms, about 22% abundant, uh, oops, sorry, across the six replicates, um, and this maps to a uh, sulfate-reducing Dosulvarculus barcii. The next eight bins account for uh, about 66% of the total abundance of the community, and you'll also notice that I'd included two uh, bins with very low abundance. Um, but you'll see that we have another sulfate reducer and two other uh, possible sulfate reducers. And so now if we switch to uh, the activity, looking at our metatranscriptomics, um, the reason I included those two very low abundant bin, low abundance bins is because uh, bin 127 is actually our most active bin. And so this maps to the sulfur of vibrio alkali phyllis. Um, and so it appears that we have um, some s uh, sulfate reducing organisms um, at work in the reversible system. And so I'm gonna focus on our two uh, most abundant and most active organisms. Again, we have the Sulfarculus barcii, which is our most abundant. It's a sulfate reducer, a mesophile, and has been shown to oxidize formate and acetate to carbon dioxide via the wood lung dull pathway. Our most active or organism is also our most interesting organism. So it's technically classified as a sulfate reducer, but in pure culture in the lab, it has been shown um, to oxidize sulfide with a high expression of sulfate reduction genes. So this organism actually doesn't have any genes for sulfide oxidation, but in culture, it oxidizes sulfide um, via possibly the sulfate reduction pathway. Um, it also has genes uh, for carbon fixation, and it has been associated with an anode in uh, a sulfide oxidizing bioelectrochemical system. And so um, we wanted to look at what genes were differentially expressed between our two different potentials, so when the electrode's operating as an anode versus when it's operating as a cathode. And basically I highlighted in red um, that the most highly uh, expressed genes are um, a bunch of heterodisulfide reductases. Uh, these were initially characterized in methanogens, but in bacteria they're considered um, to replace the reverse dissimilatory sulfite reductase genes. Um, and so uh, these genes are uh, down-regulated at a cathode, and now we can sort of start thinking about what metabolism is occurring in our system.
But first, we wanted to look at what genes were highly expressed at both conditions. And so these genes were highly expressed both at an, an anode or at a cathodic potential. And we have the complete genes um, pathway for sulfate reduction. And these genes are also actually um, correlated with our most active organism, the sulfur of Vibrio alkali phyllis. And so if we put all this together, including um, looking through the literature um, at pure cultures of uh, alkali phyllis, what we think is happening is that when the electrode is operating as a cathode, um, this is offering um, electrons to the microorganisms, and we believe that sulfate reduction is taking place through the normal sulfate reduction pathway for which all of the genes are highly expressed. However, at an anode, we believe that sulfide oxidation is occurring, again, from our same highly active organism, but through a proposed reversal of the normal sulfate reduction pathway. And Thorup et al. are the ones that had seen um, this sulfate reducer performing sulfide oxidation with high expression of the sulfate reduction genes, and they propose a new uh, pathway for sulfide oxidation that is simply a reverse of the sulfite, um, of the sulfate reduction pathway. And so, um, again, since we also see uh, our, main org our main active organism um, at the anode of BESs in other systems, uh, this is our current hypothesis. And so to bring this back to uh, astrobiology, um, throughout the week we've heard a lot about following the energy sources and also a lot about what we don't know. And so um, as Lori and Pete mentioned, I think BES are a great way to culture either pure, pure, um, pure cultures of organisms or communities and look directly at electron transfer and what energy sources are required for um, those kinds of uh, events. And so um, I'll leave you with this slide, and I'll take any questions if we have time, or you can catch me on your way to lunch. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions. The first, uh, did these uh, reversible uh, uh, oxidation reduction occur equally uh, in the light and the dark? And then uh, the second question would be, um, relating back to the previous speaker and a comment you made. Mm -hmm. um, how, much, uh, how much can you store uh, for, for future use? And uh, I'm, are you talking about the seafloor for, for, for submersibles? How would, how would that affect the surrounding ecology of the seafloor? Mm -hmm. Um, so for the first question, I don't, we haven't looked at light versus dark. We've just been looking at um, non-photosynthetic communities. Um, so I can't, um, unfortunately I can't answer that question. But for the second question, so we're, our initial goal was to try to create a localized fuel source um, in the sediment because what is often limiting at that point is mass transport of the organics to, you know, and oxidation to the electrode. And so if we have a localized fuel source by the electrode where we can store these, this charge, um, it would be available later. Um, in data I haven't shown, we've tried to increase the um, time of the cycle. So this here was just a 10 minute cycle back and forth. We've gone up to 12 hours and the bacteria do not like that. So we tried to mimic a diurnal uh, um, cycle and basically it resulted in um, bacterial death. The, the current was not produced. And so this, um, this system isn't actually in a river or ocean sediment. We do have other actual uh, systems that are in ocean sediment, but I don't know the specific parameters of the, that current generation or what, what they see at them. But Lenny Tender is um, one of my co-authors, and he, he has systems actually out in the ocean. Okay, well, thank you all for staying, and... Um, have a nice lunch. <laughs> <laughs>